All right, here we go. Today we have Jay Alexander Martin, co-founder of FUBU, one of the biggest black-owned clothing companies of all time, who at their peak grossed over $350 million in annual worldwide sales. Welcome to Vlad TV. Oh, man, this is crazy. This is a long time coming. Yeah, yeah, man. We've known about each other for a while, yeah. but this is the first time we're actually meeting. Yeah, that's crazy, right? <laughs> this is your first time here as well. Yeah. So I want to get into the whole story. Let's start in the very beginning. Let's go. Born and raised in Queens, New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, your dad has an interesting story. He worked for the Depository Trust Company his whole life. Mm -hmm. So I actually looked them up. Um, They settle hundreds of trillions of dollars (laughs) of uh, basically transactions worldwide. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of trillions of Mm -hmm. dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I knew about money way back when. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Real money. <laughs> Real money. Real serious money. And I guess your dad started as a clerk yep. and worked his way up to vice president. Vice president. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And your mom had a secretarial business. Yep. So you kind of grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Yeah. And it's funny you add that. I was actually adopted. So right. I got adopted into that family. So actually it was a blessing in that case. You know, you have two, you know, well to do, really working hard, you know, all about work and, and push and, and, and entrepreneurship from day one. Okay. What was the whole story behind the adoption? Because you and your brother were adopted? No, actually, I was just adopted. I, I, to be honest, you know, it's really weird because I know I have brothers and sisters out there. I just don't know who they are. Um, no, I'm not going to probably go look for them because I'm very happy with the family that I have now. I really appreciate where I'm at and, what, you know, how they raised me, where I am, what I am today, you know? Absolutely. Okay, so you're growing up in Queens, and you actually met uh, Damon John in sixth grade. Mm-hmm. Sixth grade. Okay, and then afterwards, uh, Carlton E. Brown, mm-hmm. you guys well, met so them. Carlton, so basically, Carlton was Damon's friend prior to because Damon lived uh, like a baby a block and a half away from, from Carl. I lived about maybe four blocks away from Damon, but we met in school. Yes. Okay, and this is three of the co-founders yes, three already co-founders. knowing yeah. each other knowing each early other. in right. school. Okay, and I guess as a kid, you started working at the mall. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, like any other kid that uh-huh. time, you, you know, either get a job, you know, uh, a paper route or something like that. But I chose to kind of go go to the mall and try to get a fashion school, fashion job. Okay. And you started buying clothes yeah. with that money. Yeah. I saw you. Because you had to be what they call, quote unquote, fresh. Right. Back then. <laughs> if you wasn't fresh, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't good for you. You know what I mean? Okay. So you're working at the mall to get fresh. But a lot of times people take the shortcut. Right, because you work at the mall, you're making minimum wage, and you pay taxes. So that check is, is really small. And a lot of guys say, you know, F all that. I'm just going to hit the streets and make that that fast. Right, right. But were you ever tempted to just say, screw the small job? And No, actually, it's funny because no, not at all. I was never tempted in that respect because I had, I had a certain drive that I knew I wanted to do something different. I always felt like, you know, that was fast money. I'd rather get it a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's funny, it's also a lot of the guys that I've known from back then, I see them now and then they're like not necessarily well to do or, or not really okay and either getting out of jail or, you know, have a ailments, just, just really messed up. And yeah. I see them today and I'm like, man, I wish I would have just stuck to what, you know, you were doing, stuck to something else. Because in the end, you know, you, you, can, you can get it today, but then I'd rather have it tomorrow because that's more longevity. Most people just, you know, especially today with social media and things like that, you just want to fly off and, and be it. But then again, you know, it's almost like uh, a slingshot. You know, you go through all these particular problems and go through all this to try to get something going. And when you let it go, you go real far, mm-hmm. you know. And I'd rather have it, like I said, in the end than for versus now, you know. Okay. So you're going to school. You're making a little bit of money working at the mall. And then there's a co-op program. Yeah. That you started doing. Yeah. Uh, Damon was part of this program too? Damon was in the co-op program, yes. Okay. Yes. And what was that program like? Well, the co-op, co-op was more so like you go to school one week and then you work one week. Mm. So we would have like such liberties as just kind of not having to go to school. We can go to school late. Um, normally we'd get out of school early. We would go for lunch. We would go out of, out and go to like a different restaurant or go to a, a, the mall, go wherever, go to the store. Uh, and and we just had liberties where nobody else had because we were never really in school. We were mostly, mostly working. Mm-hmm. And it was really good for us, I guess both of us per se, because I remember Damon had a job. I had a job as a messenger and then Damon had a, also had a job as a messenger. And it kind of just taught us, you know, work ethic. 
and and the drive to just keep going. And from that on, you know, once we left that, of course, we were partners in that respect of knowing that, you know, we both have drive to do something. And, you know, I guess FUBU, of course, how South FUBU started and, you know, the rest is history. Right. And in that co-op program, you met Keith Perrin. Yeah. So Keith there's Perrin. the fourth person. Right, so there's the fourth person. There you so go. then Keith was working at, I believe he was working for a realtor, uh, um, I guess the city of uh, in New York City, something I can't really remember. That's so far back. But he was working for there, and he wound up actually leaving that job, and then we all wound up moving into Damon's house because I was there. Um, I would I came home from the military. Now, there's fast. You got to go backwards because remember I was in the military. Right. And I want to get into that part of the story. Uh, so, I guess you barely finished high school. Right. Barely. <laughs> barely. Barely. Your dad convinced you to join the well, Navy. Well, a little more convinced. It was either you're going to leave here or you're going to go to the military. Which one? (laughs) My odds were better in the military. Okay. So you're in the military. And at this point, are you thinking like this is your career for the rest of your life? Like I'm going to keep working my way up in the Navy? Well, no. I never thought that. I always thought that every day I'm going to be there is the day I'm going to get out. Mm. Because you could own in the military, part of me of being having drive – and and seeing my parents kind of go all the way up to where they, you know, to, to achieve all the things they achieve, I always wanted to achieve more. But in the military, you know, they give you a check and everything you have to do, you basically have to ask them for everything, you know, ask them to get married, you know. So it was just too many rules and regulations for me. Now, it, was, it could be good for somebody else, but to say it wasn't really good for me in that respect. So I wanted to kind of get every day, I wanted to figure out how I was going to get out. But I guess, you know, but then again, part two of me was like, oh, I'm going to get out to do what? So it was of that struggle back and forth of, look, I can have a career here. I have some other family members that had a career, did 20 years. You know, I was actually doing well um, in that respect. I already had tons and tons of medals from being at war and all that. So I could have stayed. Um, well, I couldn't have stayed but because of the accident. But in, in, in hindsight, if I would have stayed, um, I'm glad I didn't stay because, you know, my future was much, much brighter being out. Right. You mentioned the accident. You ended up getting into a... A, like an accident in a cab, right? Yeah, car, yeah, car on base. And I wound up uh, being halfway paralyzed. Um, it was a slip disc, and then it was a swell disc in my back, and I couldn't move my legs. Um, I had to go through therapy, got, got, my, got to be able to walk again, and I have uh, actually a 50% disabled to date. Um, I wake up with pain, but I live, I, live, I live with it and keep it moving. Okay, so you basically get an honorable discharge. I get, yeah, medical justice. Medical justice. Charge. Charge. Okay, got it. So now you're out of the military. Mm-hmm. There goes your plan A. Yeah, plan yeah. now, now I'm like, what am I going to do now? Plan B. Right, plan B. You go to FIT. Right, so I go to FIT and I'm working at Macy's at the same time. Right. FIT, for those that don't know, stands for Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. And you're working at Macy's. And I guess at FIT, you reconnect with Damon John? Well, yeah, I, re- I reconnect with Damon John. Um, I went, I'm going by his house. I'm home. I'm just got back. What's up? What's going on? Um, and he, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Cause I walk in, he had this little table, um, in the kitchen and then we was all sitting there and, and it was a hat sitting on the table. And I'm like, what's this? He's like, oh, it was a hat. You know, I made a couple, sold a couple, kept it moving. Like now I'm looking to, to pick out my next thing. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm looking at it closely and I'm like, well, what's it mean? So it says FUBU, FUBU, how do you explain FUBU? And I'm like, that sounds nice. What does that mean? And I was like, oh, well, um, you know, what's that? What you doing with that? What are you doing? So I'm like, well, FUBU, I like it. All right, well, let me turn it into a clothing line. So he's looking like I got four heads and six arms and I'm like, turn it into a clothing line. He's like, how, how could you turn it into clothing line? Well, I'm going to FIT, I'm going to, I'm going to school, I, I could I could do this. He's like, okay, we don't have any money. I said, well, I got money. I give you, I had six thousand dollars. I kept a thousand, bought some clothes, and gave him five thousand. The rest was history. Okay, and these were uh, tie top hats. Tie top hats, which I think Tupac really popularized. Yeah, yeah around that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you'd have the thug life, yeah, and the tie yeah. top in the back. Yep. Exactly Tretch from Naughty by Nature probably wore right, those Right, right. Well. But like you said, it was in and out. So it's yeah. like, you, what's your next thing? They was really the next thing. And Dame was funny because Dame was the type of guy, look, he could figure it out. Like, he's going to make it happen. He's going to do a hook or crook. He's going to, if he's selling mirrors, he used to sell mirrors. He sell all sorts of stuff. Whatever it is, he's going to make it happen. So he was a shark back then. I was more creative, but he's a shark. He's, he was going to make it happen. 
okay, so you guys are now considering launching this this fashion line, mm -hmm. but five thousand dollars ain't gonna do it. No, five thousand not gonna do it, but it's start. Yeah. So what we was doing is we would make a hat. We would go to a video set, put it on the video set, put it on somebody, take it back, or make a shirt, sorry, or take it back. And then we would, you know, make a box of it, we'd sell it. Um, and then we would take that proceeds, flip it, flip it, flip it. And that's just how we kept doing, flipping, 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 flipping t-shirts to the point where um, we, got, you know, we placed it in a, um, a few shows and videos and stuff like that. And now all of a sudden we're getting some good advertising. Um, we, we know LL. So I, I wound up, it's a funny story, I could tell you a story about LL. So LL used to be in a rap group. Really? LL used Why to be in a rap group. Why did I not group. know this? Okay, yeah, no what knows group this. was LL in? I, I don't remember the name, but he was used to be in a rap group. So LL's best friend, which was in the rap group, his brother was my best friend. Okay. So we were in a rap group. So LL would come and try to teach us how to rap and, and stuff like that. So that's how LL became uh, friends with us regarding, um, you know, and helping us later on down the line as far as to, for FUBU was concerned. Yep. And I'll get into that part as well. Um, didn't Damon John mortgage his home for like $100,000? Yeah, so Damon, Damon mortgaged his house, right? We used that for another seed, seed run. Okay. Um, and because I wound up saying, telling them, look, we got to go to this thing called the magic show. Mm-hmm. Once we went to the magic show, uh, we got a whole bunch of orders, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of orders. And I was like, yes. But then again, we have no way to produce it. So we started putting out, you know, feelers on, in the newspaper for, you know, people to come and finance it, uh, stuff like that. And then was like, well, listen, why don't we just try to mortgage the house? And we mortgaged the house, took some of that money, used it, took some money to fix up the house. And we, from there on, we just kept going. Right. So I guess you took the 100000 out of the house. And you guys started working out of the house itself, right? Yes. Half the house became yes. food. Half the house. Right, right. <laughs> so I wouldn't pay rent for say because I was actually working the business. So Damon was actually working at Red Lobster while I was working the business. He was working at Red Lobster during that yeah. time. That's great. Okay, because before then you were working for Macy's, right? Right, right. Correct. And I guess there's a story about you quitting Macy's. Yeah, that's a really crazy story. So, I, again, I'm very ambitious. I'm very hardworking. I used to work. If I could work 24 hours a day, I would. Right. So. In that case, there was a, I wanted to actually really be a buyer. So if this FUBU thing didn't work, I was going to be a buyer. I was going to be in fashion, hook a crook. I didn't care. So I wound up, uh, I used to work for this tie department, right? And they used to have ties of like $100, $200, $300, sometimes even $500. So I would not suddenly be in charge of it, but I would be the one that everybody would come to to get their suits put together, ties to get their shirts put together. So um, I would sometimes even have a line of people there waiting for me to kind of you know uh, style their clothing. So long story short, uh, I got the you know my the start the the head merchandise managers of the floor started looking. It's like, oh, who's this guy? Well, this guy is good. You know, I, I tell him, hey, I wanted to be a buyer. So the manager there at the time. You know, I don't know if he, I guess assuming that he didn't really like that, you know, because it's like, what are you trying to do, take off my job? And I'm like, look, bro, I'm just trying to make it and make my own way. So long story short, one day he comes in and says, and says, I need to talk, you know, come to the office. So he tells me, hey, listen, I am, I found this tie and, and I think he was trying to steal it. And I'm like, bro, I'm not trying to steal nothing. Like if I could steal something, I'm going to steal a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar tie. I ain't gonna steal the tie that's on sale. It's nine ninety nine as it is on sale plus my discount. It had been like three ninety nine. Why would I steal that? Like it just not making any logical sense. And he was like, "Well, I have to write you up." I said, "If you write me up, I'm not gonna be able to get in the buyers program." Please look. I'm telling you, bro. I'm not trying to steal something. And he wrote me up anyway. And I quit. I said, "The next time I come back in Macy's, I'm gonna be selling to you." And then I went full for full for. I mean, all in into um, working with Fubu. Okay, so you guys go to the magic show, you get a bunch of orders, like $300,000 worth yeah. of orders, right? Mm -hmm. So now you guys are trying to, you know, make these orders and so forth. And I guess that uh, your mom suggested to advertise in the New York actually, Times? Actually, Damon's mother suggested it. Um, and also one of my friends has suggested it. So we were both kind of all thinking the same thing of why don't we just go, you know, put an ad in the paper and 
and maybe somebody would come in and, you know, but again, we got a lot of shysty people because, you know, order purchase financing is really for sharks as well. Mm -hmm. So they want to, they see blood in the water or you need money for orders and all of a sudden, you know, it just didn't work out right. But there were once one company that actually made a little bit of sense that we actually entertained and, but we didn't work with them the, the, the first time we started working with, actually we worked with them the second time they came back around um, when we worked with them, which was Samsung. Okay, so Samsung is an electronics company. Mm -hmm. Why would they invest in a clothing company? Well, they, it, they have a textile division and basically oh, they okay. came on as a, as, a, as a distributor of us and they was able to get us, you know, because we had such a buzz at that time. We had LL, the hottest guy in, uh, in, the U, in America, probably even globally at that point. And we, it was just holding back the raids. Like, so we didn't really get it out to everybody, but everybody could see it, you know, in videos and see it here and see it there, but they couldn't buy it. So when, when Samsung came in, they had distribution, warehousing, and they came in as that to where we can actually now distribute to everybody. Uh -huh. And they had salesmen and all that. So we didn't have that. We just had us. Yeah. Okay. How much money did they invest at that point? Well, it's not necessarily most mostly investing. It's more so just giving us the credit to be able to buy the goods uh -huh. to be able to sell. Got it. Right. Got it. And was it around that time that LL Cool J did the Gap commercial? Yes, around, yes. And that really blew everything off. Okay, so tell me about that commercial. So that Gap commercial is the funniest thing ever. And actually it's in textbooks. Um, it got us at museums, from four museums. Um, so I salute LL, I appreciate that from, from day one for what he, he's done for us. And so basically he came to us and said, hey, listen, I got a deal for Gap. Gap wants to co come in. They were looking for uh, a, a person to come in and get them, make them cool. So he said, well, listen, I'm work working with the company, but I'll do it, but I have to put on, I have to be able to wear and my, my own stuff. And he would say, like, okay, nah, nobody cares. Cause they figured, you know, who's this little brand? They don't know, they don't know any better, right? And, but LL took it the next step. He didn't know or, or, or just wear a hat. He turned around and put it in the actual lyrics, which they didn't understand because, again, you know, it's a cultural difference. You don't know what we're saying. You just know it sounds good because it rhymes, you know. So he did that, and a couple of heads rolled after that. Um, but, again, they wound up airing again because it was just that impactful, and it helped them so much. So, I mean, 20 years, 20, 30 years later, you know, I think that really they should come back to us and say, let's do it again. So yeah. LL basically did a commercial for Products. one clothing company right. and snuck in right. another clothing company, company. Yeah. in that same yeah. commercial and yeah. shouted out yeah. that smaller clothing yeah. company yeah. in the bigger clothing company's yeah. commercial that he's getting paid for. That he's getting paid for. Genius. I couldn't pay for that advertising. No, you can't pay for that. <laughs> so people got fired at the Gap over that? Um, I don't know if anybody got fired. I just think they may, I don't think they got fired. I think that in the longer run, when you think about it, they wound up doing a really good job. Even though it, but it's definitely a case study yeah. for everyone to, to 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 see. It's very, it's definitely a case study. Right. At this point. It, it's interesting how you fast forward 2022 and now Kanye is working with the Gap. Right. Right. <laughs> it's kind right. of like the first rapper I think since then that right. they've since worked then, with right. again. Exactly. And we'll get exactly. into that story later on. Exactly. Okay. So is that really what launched Fubu into? I mean, between the Gap and Samsung, is that when it became kind of like a yes? Big, I think real that company? yes, yes. It, that's that's when it really became a real company because at that point. You know, we're just we're just going, we're just feeding us out hand to mouth. Like we don't have distribution. We can't get it. We can't, you know, if we get an order of a, a hundred thousand pieces, we can't fulfill it. So it 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 just took us and make it made us an official official company. You know, gave us an infrastructure. And a lot of times, you know, as a small business, you don't have that infrastructure, you can't scale. And that aggregate gave us the ability to make us scale. Got it. Nineteen ninety eight rolls around. Is that when FUBU reaches peak in terms of sales? No, I think we around 2000, okay. 2002, 2003. Like okay, that. right around that yeah, time. So yeah. you guys just kept building up yeah. year yeah. after year yeah. after year. Yeah. And you hit $350 million? Right, so we were doing about $350 million for a good 10, good 10, 10, 11, 12 years, easy. Okay, starting around what? 2001, Tell, 2002. around 1998, 9, 99. Uh -huh. 
I got it. So around right. 98, that's right. me reaching right. that 350 right. Right. globally. Right. And you guys are now expanding globally as globally, well. Yes. It's not oh, just- globally is not the word. <laughs> and we're still global to, to this day. I mean, were the global sales early on, I know later on things change, but around this 98, 2002 era, was the global sales overtaking the US sales? No, no. I believe the, the, the uh, US sales were still the highest. Got it. Yeah. And I mean, I always assumed from the outside looking in that LL was one of the owners or investors. Or no, we gave like him. We gave him peace. Yeah, so he, he got a piece. Got, no, thank you. Uh -huh. I had, we had to like, look, thank you. Here's something. <laughs> you know, we definitely okay. gave him a piece. I mean, it's, it's class B, class B stock, but it's still, look, here's something, man. Thank you for whatever you've done. What, you know, got all it. of you done. Got it. You personally, what did the money start to pour in? Oh, I started making money day one. No, but I mean real money. Real money. No, real money. Real My money first from day check one? was a million dollars. Okay, not day one <laughs> when you first launched. I'm just talking about what year. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, what year did the million dollars for you come in? Oh, what year? Um, sheesh. Okay, so 1992, three, four, five, six, seven, 97. Around 97. Around 97. Okay. How'd you spend your first million dollars? I bought a house. I bought some Cartier glasses. Right. And I redid the house and couldn't even sleep in it for a year. <laughs> I was living in hotels for a year. Because you were remodeling. Yeah, remodeling. Okay, you started buying cars. Oh, definitely. I have four or five cars. Started buying watches. Do I? I still, <laughs> still got a few. But uh, yeah, no, I was crazy. I bought so much uh, diamonds out. I, I had diamond belt buckles. I had ten carat watts, ten carat um, sorry, ten carat um, um ring rings. I had, I was ridiculous. Right. You know, living in, living way above, it made no sense what I was doing. You had a black card. A so black there's no card. limit. I had the first black card. The first black card. Yeah. I probably had the second one. Okay. Yeah. To the point where you go out and then you put your black card up and people would look like, well, what is that? I'm sorry, you, this is fake. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead and run it and see. Yeah, go ahead and run it and see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because you actually said that over the last 25 years, you've squandered close to $8 million oh, yeah. on things that are irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. I wrote a book called um, Money Makes Me Crazy, and along with another gentleman, um, Ted McMillan. And it just basically talks about how, you know, some things doesn't, they don't really make sense. And you're doing things basically for marketing, you're doing things for pleasure, but it doesn't really make sense. You know, you, you come up in a world where you don't have, and then you overcompensate when you do have. Yeah. And we have to stop doing that. You know, people just have to stop doing that. You know, um, you know, money, you have to really understand money before you get money. True. You have to understand what money could do and what money can't do. And money can't make you who you are. You have to be who you are. Mm. And a lot of times people take the money and they want to show off and do all this stuff just because they want to paint a picture of who, you know, or what a video looks like or what social media looks like. And again, that's not really, that's not, it's, that's just not what you're supposed to be doing. Right. Because you had mentioned that you were spending $20,000 a month just on clubbing. Yeah, on clubs. So you just buy bottles and tables for- Well, yeah, I would open the bar. Every time I'm in a club, I would open the bar. Like open oh, the bar. Oh, you would? Oh. I would just open the bar. So any, everyone get free, free drinks get free off drinks. of you. Right. But there was, a, there was a, a marketing tool to it because I would say, A, the food, it would say the food guys opening the bar for everybody. Oh, wow. So now you want to buy my clothes. Kind but of, there is a limit. Sorta. But there is a limit to it. <laughs> right. Because again, in, the, in those times, everybody wanted to be somebody. Yeah. But then you start thinking about everybody's somebody, but nobody's anybody. Mm. And then it becomes years and years of doing that. And then you start saying to yourself, when every time you walk around, you say, oh, that's, Fubu. that's Jay from FUBU. And then you forget, you don't even know who you are. Then you start saying, well, why am I, can I just be Jay? And then you start being tormented with that. Mm -hmm. So money makes you crazy. <laughs> I mean, if you look at, look back at like your spending, if you think of like the one thing that you feel like you really just wasted your money on, like I can't believe I spent that much money on this particular thing, what would that be? No, everything. Everything, because I could have did it. I didn't have to have, I did it in excess. 
So I could just have one watch, which is that, that is great. Like my petite, one watch. Now you need petite, you need a gold one, you need a silver one, you need a, you need the one with the rubber band. Then you need, oh my God, oh, well, uh, the Richard Milley, I gotta have that too. And then you got that one, then you got every, oh man, you need another color. I needed this color. That's where I kept going wrong. You don't have to do that. You can just have one. You don't need 30. Although, as someone who's a watch guy as well, watches are, I won't say they're investments, but they are a way to yes, park your not, money. Not, not, the watches but, you're mentioning are a place to park your money because you could essentially correct. resell them for about what you bought it for. Yes, but I less. didn't, I, again, now with education mm -hmm. to what you're doing, yes, because I didn't have the education back then. I just bought it because it looked nice. Uh -huh. You know, so I would buy the piece, you know, the, the Rolex, and then it would have all these Diamonds that oh, you somebody iced it out, which, messed, it up the out, value of which it. messed the whole value up. Right. See, you didn't. I didn't understand it. I, and then Jane when I said, my "Oh my God," here. you know, I need to break it down, and then all of a sudden it's worth five dollars. <laughs> right. You know, instead of you know having the original or or looking at it, you know, in that in that sense, because now today, of course, you know, this watches watches are worth what they are, and they either go up or go over down in value. Yeah. Um, you could park your money in that, just like uh, paintings. Mm -hmm. um, right. Just like you know, so. I mean, every year, you know, you try to buy a painting to pocket your money for taxes, things of that nature. That's a whole other thing. This is not Earn My Leisure. This is yeah, yep, yours. Yep, so. yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2001, you guys actually started a record label. Yes. Uh, you put out The Good Life yep. and uh, 54th Platoon yep. in uh, 2003, I believe. Both albums hit the charts, mm -hmm. but they weren't like huge smashes. Well, actually, no, not, not necessarily. None of them were huge smashes, but we went gold. The album went gold. Oh, really? The the Good Life album? Good Life album went gold. Okay, and who was on that album? Oh, my God. Um, LL, Ludacris, mm. um, 54 Platoon, of course. Um, darn it. There's a few others. But I think the the notable record that actually did very well was uh, Fatty Girl. Yeah, I remember that record. And that was really that was that that was what, what was known as far as that album concerned. But our only downfall is not necessarily that it wasn't good or good enough to keep going. It's that it dropped on um, 9/11. Ah, okay. Yeah, I was a Fatty Girls, LL Cool J, Ludacris, and Keith Murray. Yeah, yeah. I remember that video. Yeah, cool video. <laughs> We we were watching all of that video. <laughs> right, I remember. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I remember. And, and was there a reason why you guys stopped with the music after the fifty four? Well, we album? stopped with the music because, of course, nine eleven um, kind of had music dormant and everything dormant for a little while. But we had gotten to a little situation with Universal, which was our partner, mm -hmm. and and, this, and that. And what happened was, uh, we had some clauses that they actually broke, so we wound up owing them money. They wound up owing us money, and we just dissolved it all together. Got it. So by 2003, and I mean, this is according to, to Damon John, mm -hmm. it seemed like FUBU started to get oversaturated. Um, he, you know, he said, let me, let me yeah, just quote him. Yeah, sorry, call, sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Yeah. I ju just want to quote what he said. He said, the biggest mistake we made with the brand was buying more inventory than we needed. That was around 2001. That's part of it. It's not the end, be in all. But again, um, there's a lot of things that, that contribute to that. I mean, time, you know, uh, uh, saturation, not just us in the market, saturation of other brands in the market. Um, you know, our clothes for, for, for people, and I, this is my viewpoint, and my viewpoint more so is the fact that people always looked at us at a high, high level. And then what, in this business, you know, it's called volume. And a lot of times you want to sell, 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 sell. And and you drop your price, you drop your quality, and you start selling to certain dis certain discounters directly instead of them getting it after the fact. Mm -hmm. And after a while, that's the saturation that he's talking about, because that's basically what it was. And then people could keep if you could stay up here at a higher end, then it doesn't matter what's going on because not that everybody can get it, and that keeps the drive for hmm. for, for for that pro particular product. Right. I mean, because when you look at FUBU, I believe that it follows the footsteps of Carl Kanai and before yes. them, oh, Cross the, Colors. The, the first of all, give him all respect, forefather. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, Carl Kanai came from the Cross Colors, yep. you know, mm -hmm. family tree. Yep. I mean, Walker Ware was around yep. during that yep. time as well. And, you know, 
complex. I mean, not complex, but uh, Echo, Echo was sort of well, Echo. Echo is after us. After you guys, yeah. Okay, Echo's after us. Okay, got it. But but before you guys, like I said, Carl and I was big. Mm-hmm. Cross Colors was big. I mean, Cross Colors I think was the first black owned brand that got into yeah. Macy's. Yeah. And you eventually got into Macy's. Yeah. So that actually, promise more, you made. More than Macy's, we were in the ma- in the window of Macy's. Right, exactly. Which is the, f- never heard of. Which is what you promised that guy right. exactly. when you were quitting. Exactly, exactly. How did that feel? To be I, like, boom, look. It, it, that's <laughs> the first where, that's the first time that I, I felt in my life that I say what I say and I, and I do what I do. Mm. There we go. So uh, by 2003, was that when you guys started kind of pulling away from the U.S. market and sort of focusing on other countries? Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna set it straight. Part of that is right, but part of that is wrong. Part of it is the market here started pulling away from us. Okay. And I think it's time for us to, as far as a brand, to start really realizing that, because again, you know, things change. It's just it's like any business. Business goes up, business goes down. Bell curve. So at a at a, a time, you know. There's other brands out there. People are getting older, you know, younger. We're not really going for the younger per person. We're still stuck in our head that we're going to just go do what we want to do. And we suffer for it. Okay. And you guys started focusing on other countries, Saudi Arabia, China, Korea, Japan, South Africa. Mm-hmm. Is that pretty accurate? Mm-hmm. And how are those markets in regards to how they accepted food? They, they love us. They uh-huh. loved us and still love us to, till today. Uh, they don't, for instance, if you make a, a simple uh, hat, FB, you put on it, nostalgic. Like for her, here, it's nostalgic. For there, it's every day. It's all they want to see. They don't want to see anything newer. They want to see what they, that, that FB, that classic look. They don't want to see anything else. And for here, after a while, you start seeing this classic stuff. It's after a while, it's like, only time I can wear that is if I wear it at a, you know, a, a 90s party or 80s party, you know what I mean? Yeah. So we had to learn learn that the hard way and start making, creating newer designs, newer, you know, newer fashion, and that way we can kind of get back into the marketplace. And you know, from that on, now we're, we're pretty cool for now. Right, because even by 2009, you guys were making like 200 million a year. Right, so yeah, we're still, we still making money. Right. We never stopped making money. Got it. Right. Got it. And I guess 2009, that was the same year that uh, Damon John joins uh, Shark Tank. Shark Tank. Right. How was that? <laughs> when suddenly here's well, the founder, one of the founders is on this big TV show that's still running, right? Well, I'll tell you a quick story. When he first was asked to do the, have the for that gig, um, he came to me and was like, man, I don't know if I should do this. It's going to change my life. It's going to, you know, it may even hurt my family. It's going to definitely change what we're doing. It's going to change our relationships. It's going to change everything. I don't know if I should do it. And I said, well, is it an opportunity that's going to help you? Is it an opportunity that's going to, you know, make you better or make or, or just, you know, whatever, just be, you know, good for you? And he was like, yeah, well, yes, but no, but yes, but no. I said, bro, you got to, you know, think in your heart what you want to do. But well, no matter what you do, I'm here for you. But if, I, if it was me telling you, I would tell you to go, bro. Just go. Do it, man. You got a blessing. This is a blessing in disguise. You can move on and do other things, you know. And if something happens and, you know, you stop doing it, hey, we're here for you too. But, bro, don't miss out on this opportunity. Go ahead and do it. And he went and did it. And I'm, I'm so proud of him, all the stuff he's been doing. I mean, shit, he's probably the number one, number two, three speaker in the world mm. at this point. Okay. Um, you know, he's been on the season, what, 13 years, a couple of Emmys. Yo, proud of the brother. How does actual investments? I don't watch the show on a regular basis. Like the companies he invested in, overall, did any of them really blow up? Or I, I I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> I don't know if I, I can talk about back. that. I think Mark Cuban said that overall his investments really weren't the best. Like if you look at all of his investments yeah, yeah. on Shark Tank, I mean, you could listen. You listen. You could see right then and there that a lot of these guys aren't what they say, y'all. I'll just leave it at that. Fair you enough. Know, you know. Okay. Um, 2010, you guys actually relaunched in the U.S., calling yourselves uh, FB Legacy. Right. Okay. Did that make an impact when you did that? No. No. Why is that? Uh, I don't think the U.S. was ready yet. Mm. Um, I think it took us another eight, nine years to actually come back again. 
Um, but we had to come back and get co-signed. You know, we had to come back with Puma. We had to come back with uh, Forever 21 yeah. collaborations, things like that. And now we're back in the marketplace and we're now we're doing it very well in the big one. Okay, and I want to get to that part uh, as well. I just want to kind of get established yeah, the time I'm here. Line. I know. I, I, yeah, it's, 30, it's 30 years we're talking yeah, about. exactly. No, <laughs> it's, no, it's time. fair you know, for you to <laughs> jump around, you know, in, in your, uh, you know, train of thought. Um, I just want to point out, in 2013, Virgil uh, launches Off-White. Mm -hmm. Did you know about Virgil back then? No. I've, you know, it's, I'm not going to say, say this. I guess I'm going to say this. I'm a type of guy, I mind my business. You know, I am, I'm a type of guy, I believe in, well, back when we had toll boots, I would drive down in the, to you know, drive down the highway, and if I saw that it was packed, I would jump off and get on it, get off, get off the exit and keep going somewhere else. Or I would come up to uh, the toll booth and I would look to the right and see there's nobody there. I'm not the type of guy that's gonna jump on the line and do what everybody else is doing. I'm the type of guy, I'm gonna have my own vision, my own thing. Mm -hmm. So I never care about, too tough about what somebody else is doing. Although I would, I'm, I would keep an eye out, but I don't really care what everybody else is doing because I know what I'm doing. And what I'm doing is, is, is God sent and I'm gonna just keep doing what I'm doing. It's gonna work and that's that. Right, because along the way, weren't you guys acquiring like smaller clothing yes, brands as well? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, did any of them really pan out and blow up, or um, um, uh, Kuji. Ah, Kuji. Of course, Kuji. Okay, I didn't Kuji's know you guys. Probably one that. of our biggest ones. Aha. Yeah. They're still doing stuff, right? Yes, still, 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 still have Kuji. Okay, still doing it. were they already established when you guys bought them? Yeah, or? already established. Yeah. Aha. Yeah. Okay, so you guys got them after the biggie yeah, Kuji sweater big, era. Right, 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 right. right. Okay, in 2016, Solange dropped a song yes. called FUBU. Yes. Uh, from the unsolicited. Season. Right. And unsolicited, by the way. Right, uh, from her album. She just did it out of, out of, I mean, I was like, if this is happening. <laughs> well, she actually spoke, spoke about it. She said, I named it FUBU because I wanted to empower, and I looked at people who have done that in their own ways. I thought of FUBU, the brand meaning for us, by us. What kind of power... It had now and how normalized it became to wear that kind of symbolism every day. I remember reading stories on the product placement and seeing L Cool J wearing a FUBU hat in a National Gap advertisement. FUBU exhibited blackness in any space on a huge global level. And that is what I wanted to do with the song. Mm, that's nice. You never heard that before? Never heard it before. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you'd actually touched on this before. By 2018, Puma came in and collabed with you guys. Yes. How did that work out? Oh, it was really it did it did well. Um, we went. I think we were in uh, about twenty Foot Lockers. I can't, I can't. I don't know the exact number, but we were we had a huge presence uh, in Foot Locker, and it was it was a good thing. It's a good thing. I still have mine, my Pumas. <laughs> okay, and then and that... it, especially growing up wearing Puma. Yeah. And now, all of a sudden, Especially you know, in hip -hop. Right. Like, yeah, before Adidas, right. Puma, before Adidas, Puma was, was it. Break dance Puma was right. Puma was it, right. That's what we wore right. when right. I was breakdancing. Right. Adidas came, that was more when Run DMC started right. pushing. Right, when Run DMC switched like up. I'm from Queens, so I should have been switched up and more. Yeah. yeah but uh, again, yeah. The Puma they both the were the same yeah, to me. The Puma right. with the fat laces right. was right. a very hip hop right. Right. thing in the very right. beginning. It started. In the 80s. It started. Right. And then that next year in 2019, you guys partnered with. Forever 21? Forever 21. Okay. How did and, that work out? Oh, that was fantastic. I mean, that was beyond comprehensive. I, I was sectioned with us so huge. We went to, you know, most of uh, the locations, did in stores, um, presenting a bunch of people outside. Um, huge, like, social media campaign. It was great. 2020, COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And the George Floyd incident sort of triggered the whole Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. And you guys actually got involved with that. Right, we got involved for a second. Um, as of now, we, you know, we've kind of parted our ways due to unforeseen circumstances in respects to you know, things going on. Right. But, You're talking about uh, all the money drama, right, the, yeah, the $10 yeah, million dollars yeah, disappearing, yeah, yeah, I, the, the uh, multiple mansions yeah, being bought. Yeah, 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 yeah. How did you feel as a company that you partnered with and you're seeing this kind of thing? You know, it's disappointing. Hmm. It's heartbreaking, discerning, because, again, you know, we have 30 years of what we've done. Yeah. And to 
and to break it down in one second by having you know collaboration with you, I, I can't I can't have that. Yeah, I can't have that. Oh, and again, I don't know if it's proven or not proven, and I, I'm never one to jump to a conclusion until I see 100% facts. Now, I, when I see there are start some facts there, so that's the only reason why I would speak on it. Other than that, if anything happens in the media, whatever, I shut my mouth because again, you never know until you know. Yeah. You know, and then you don't know where that person was and what happened or what circumstance led to that or whatever. So I usually just be quiet and do me. Well, you know, I touched on Virgil before. In 2021, LVMH bought 60% of Off-White. And then unfortunately the next year Virgil passes away. So I'm sure that he probably knew right. what was coming and right. he wanted to right. set his family up and so forth. When you look at what Off-White did, you know, with Virgil becoming the artistic director of uh, Louis Vuitton menswear, selling off the company, still very viable of, of a company. Is this what you kind of talked about, about being at a high price point and being able to survive a longer amount of time by being more of a premium brand? Yeah, Whereas I, other, yes. you know, other black owned brands, you know, kind of stumbled at certain points, including, you know, you guys, Carl Kanai, Cross Colors, you know, sort of the, the history of, mm -hmm. of important black fashion brands, it seems like Virgil kind of broke that mold a bit. Yes, and that's very commendable in that respect because he was able to come across as high end mm -hmm. to where we were moderate. Mm. You know, and I remember stories of people coming up to me saying, oh my God, I used to wear FUBU and it was so expensive. And I'm like, it was? I don't believe, I don't remember being that expensive. Right. I thought it was moderate. You know, because it was, you know, but, you know, the if you look at the Gucci's and Prada's and all that stuff, they can out, they have outlasted everything and transcended beyond time in respects. You know, for us to have 30 years and then we have to start all over again to kind of get to that peak again, which is weird. It's, I believe it's just psychological and how people look at fashion and look at urban brands just because it's actually, it actually has to be a, a black person. Now, for him, he got outside that mold hmm. and went Elvin H. But again, he's still going to the person that everyone still sees as it, the European fashion brand. Hmm. You know, so now today, I, I just went to uh, Harlem Fashion Rose uh, in 15 year event uh, yesterday. And, you know, it's, it was a, 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 a mirror or a, a medley or a, a mashup of tons of small little you know, European, but black designers with eccentric this, eccentric that. But again, the problem is you can't sell it. So we're in a cash 22 when you really understand the business of you making something that's so avant-garde and so crazy and so wow, but you can't sell it. So how are you gonna have a business? So for us, we were able to take uh, clothing and make it sellable and sellable at a better price in volume. Okay, because when I think like of, of another black owned fashion brand that really kind of broke the mold, in this case it's accessories, is Telfar, which is like a vegan leather bag right. company that has kind of a, a slightly lower price point than like a Louis Vuitton or a Gucci, but they're in such high demand that you have to like wait a year mm -hmm. to even get one of these. Well, there you go. You gotta wait a year to get one. Yeah. So now it becomes special. Right. Or you have to go to the resellers, and I'm Correct. sure that price is, Correct. is cranked up. Correct. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's just analyzing how certain brands continue to do well. Because Gucci wasn't always a hot brand. No. At one point, Gucci was sort of, yeah, sort of yeah. starting to get kind of played out. But, but then they opened it up just like a club. A club is a hot club, and, and, and when it goes down, what do they do? They bring in the bottle, bottle girls and the bottle and uh, and the urban crowd because that's when it's going down and that's when you make the most money. And that's just how it is. Right. You know, I look at, for example, like a Dior. I personally feel that Dior needs to pay uh, Pop Smoke's family like a hundred <laughs> yeah. million dollars yeah, yeah. because before Pop Smoke was talking about Dior, no one was really checking for Dior. Like right. That. But see, that's what I, I try to tell people. You know, you gotta mind your business. When I say mind your business. If you're gonna be strategic by placing things in certain records, go get a deal first. Hmm. Go if I have a manager that can look out and foreshadow and forecast what the next things are gonna be, get a deal with them, get a piece of the company, or take a company just like LL did and say, hey, listen, let me help build this brand yeah. with you. 
mind your business. No, you're just doing because it sounds good. Okay, and then you can't you can't go back afterwards talking about give me some money. It's right. too late. No, they're like, thanks. Thanks. No, listen, <laughs> I was in Paris recently, and, and I remember going, uh, you know, down Champ uh, Champelis, uh, you know, Boulevard, where all like the the flagship stores, the Louis Vuitton flagship store, and it's like I'm looking at the Dior store, and it has a line going down the block, and I'm like, this was not it ten years ago. No. This was like as someone who buys, you know, designer clothes and, and accessories. Dior was not one of those companies I was checking for. I no. was going to the Gucci store. I was going to the Louis store. I was going to Burberry. Pop Smoke, I really single-handedly created a spotlight on this brand. And now everyone's wearing Dior. Mm -hmm. Little Baby's wearing Dior. You know, 50 Cent's wearing yeah, Dior. Right. Like whoever, you know, whoever the hot rapper is, is they're wearing Dior. And I feel it's all about how Pop Smokes are just shouting them out in a lot of his big records. In right. the beginning, and then when he passed away, it sort of immortalized those records even further. Yeah, and Dior probably said thanks. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and, and if they even if they even know if they even said that, even if they even, even know, <laughs> because like I said, what has to have has to happen is that people really have to start really being strategic on what they say and what they do. Yeah. Well, most recently, you launched a streaming platform. Yes, which is on your shirt. Yes, for us, by us. Network. Network, yes. Tell me about that. Oh my God, it's it's something that you know. Uh, my partner, uh, Roberta Rush Evans, uh, we we he's in the actually in the he was in the space of I was in the space of of, of distribution. He was in the space of production. We teamed up together to uh, to make this uh, for us bias network. We have uh, we actually launching a September fifteenth our first series, uh, Side Chicks of Charlotte. Uh, wait, and then wait, 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 wait. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the side chicks side of Charlotte. Side chicks of Charlotte. I can't uh, wait. Uh, okay, so side chicks of who? Uh, well, Whose side chicks are they? Well, see, it's like this. Everybody has a side chick. Nobody's safe. <laughs> Nobody's safe. Everyone has one. But we wanted to give that person, and they have some good women have side men. Yeah. But we wanted to give them a voice because... Again, they're screaming out. They need help. They just want to explain and tell their story and tell them how, you know, what it is and, and, and you know, the fight between, you know, should I tell the woman that I'm sleeping with the man, the fight where, or did I tell, you know, the man that I'm, like, just all that, I don't want to call it drama, but it, it's, oh, it's drama. drama. <laughs> I mean, just by the name alone. <laughs> right? Because drama. the premise of being a side chick is secrecy. Right. And you guys are doing a TV show out of it. So. Right, right, right. The cat's out the bag. As I said, nobody's right. safe. You're no longer really the side chick. So, so, the, so the thing about more after the, the show comes out, <laughs> like it's all. Well, out no, there. no, no. Well, the thing about it is, through the see through the whole season, you're gonna have to guess who's who's talking about who and who's what. Okay. Who's the side chick? Who's the side <laughs> guy? Right. You know, the, and it, I, I can't. I, you know what? I can't say this. Okay. We just started. Side Chicks LA, film it. And literally, we had to shut down production after three days to sit down and talk to everybody. Why? Because everybody's mad at each other. Of course. Is this somehow surprised <laughs> you? Was, when one, that one day there was two <laughs> fights, the two fights at the same right, time. water is wet. It's so, the same uh, place. <laughs> so it's crazy. I don't know what I did, but Hey, listen, I got, listen, this network is about telling everybody's story. I mean, we have that. We have Saucy Santana, mm -hmm. LBTQ community. We have that. We have um, a show called Whole Phase, which is a series about women and a family. Wait, that, uh, whole, phase? whole Phase? Not Whole Phase. No, not Whole, whole Phase. Not phase. Whole Phase. So a phase that woman starts to hoe. A phase about when women starts to hoe. And uh, the the characters are three main characters: the mother, the grandmother, the mother, and the daughter. Oh, the grandma. And they was, all get was, pregnant was at sixteen. The they all get pregnant at sixteen. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So one of the lines in the movie is um, talking to a guy, and he says, "The um, the uh, mom, the grandmother tells the the husband of the mother, the husband of sorry, the husband of the daughter. Listen, our family has a problem." And she's like, "What?" Well, I have our family has a problem keeping our legs closed. Hmm. So you get the rest. 
Right. And you guys have a show with uh, Charles Oakley, too. Charles Oakley cooking show. Shopping it up with Oakley. Shopping it up with Oakley. And he can cook. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised. I, I was like, oh, my bad. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I've interviewed him before. Yeah. Interesting guy. And very interesting. We smoke cigars uh, together, too. So, yeah, he's a very interesting guy. Okay. And uh, this network is launching when? Uh, this, uh, it's actually launched, okay. but we starting our um, we're starting our uh, uh, first series in uh, on September fifteenth. Got it. Yeah, but you know, we we actually launched, you know, years ago without even really launching through the Bootsy show because hmm. we had the Bootsy reality show. Bootsy, yeah, little Bootsy, we had his reality show. And funny, funny is ah, that. Okay, Fubu, I remember he was working on that. Fubu had Bootsy's clothing line. Oh, Bootsy's. Our so he's been working with him for a long time. Okay, I remember he was filming a reality show. Yeah, but it never came out. Yeah, it was. Yeah, we never we never came out. So basically, he wanted to you know do movies. Right. So we kind of said, all right, listen, this is not gonna. You know what? Let's stop what we're doing. Get ahead through your movies. If you want to come back to reality, we could talk back. It's always here for you. Uh huh. Okay, so the whole project is on hold, right? Yeah, now. it's on hold. Okay. You know, as a fashion person, when you look at Kanye lashing out at Adidas mm -hmm. and Gap mm -hmm. for copying his designs, uh, would you say? I mean, from from your point of view, are they copying his designs, or okay. when you sign a deal like that with for, a company like that, they could sort of it's all in the contract; they could see, do what they want. See, this is business, right? And in fashion, you can't necessarily copy someone because you can't trademark somebody's design. Now, what you can trademark is a logo. Okay, but, but what about, isn't you have to, there's a certain percentage that your design has to be different from theirs to avoid a lawsuit? I thought it was like 90%, you know, 10% different, 15% different. I, I'd heard different things, but this is just me from the outside hearing stuff. No, that's, no, that is artwork. You're talking about artwork. Okay. Artwork, you have to change it a certain percentage and then that you're fine. A gene is a gene is a gene is a gene. Now, the only company that I recall that has something where you can't is Levi's and you can't put the tab a certain way or can't do something a certain way or pocket. Well, you, you, can't, Other than put that, a, you can't put a red bottom on a... On and a you can't put a red or, bottom on... Louis Vuitton. Yeah, 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 Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, right. which you're wearing right now, right. literally successfully sued companies that made right. the bottoms right. But which they, I thought was weird. I'm like, how can you really but because, because trademark a color on a shoe? After like, a certain amount of time, you can you can file for a, a, a patent or a trademark for that particular thing. Okay. But again, a jean is a jean is a jean is a jean. A t-shirt is a t-shirt and a t-shirt is a t-shirt. Now, a logo, if you took that logo and you, you use that in that form or whatever, then that's a problem. If you use 05, I'm suing you. You use FUBU, F-U-B-U, -U, okay. I'm suing you. Well, Tiger had a shoe that looked a lot like Vans, and they sued. Well, well here you go. And something that, they, wait, wait, they stop. stopped the sale of that shoe. Well, it depends. It, again, it depends if they have a trademark or a patent on that particular last. Every shoe has a, a last, this part, right? And after a while... It's open to the public. It's right. open source. Like a, like a Chuck so that, Taylor like a Ch can right. be remade by right. essentially anybody. It's open source. So now open anybody source. can use that last and make any kind of combination of what they want. Right. But for example, I'm wearing Jordan 3s right now. If I, if I made a sneaker that looks just like a Jordan 3 without the Jordan logo on the back, I would be sued by Nike. Maybe. If they still have the, pat, uh, uh, the trademark on that, on that particular last. Okay. So go and normally, of course, if it's Jordans, yes, they still, they still will keep that going. Okay. Because so, it's really hard, not, not to stop you, it's really hard to get a glo I mean, a lot of money to have a global patent. I mean, a lot of money. Okay. So coming back to the Kanye thing, when he's saying, look, you, Adidas is making all these sneakers that kind of look like Yeezys. Here, here are these slides that kind of look like my slides. And here's these sneakers that kind of look like my sneakers and I'm pissed off and I'm lashing out and... Puffy supporting me and Swiss Beats is supporting me and, you know, oh, we'll never buy Adidas again because these are rip ripoffs, whatever. From your point of view, you're saying Adidas is doing nothing wrong. Uh, it depends if he has a, you know, it's all legal. 
If right. it's, it's all goes down illegal. I, listen, I never get into a, a fight between and tell someone not to wear this because of wear this. Why? Because I don't want nobody to tell me not. No, I don't want you to wear in Fubu. Don't this because then you look like this. I don't want that. That's why I try to stay out of my. I stay in my lane. But again, it all goes down to legal. Again, most people what they do is they go out and lash out in the public opinion and let public opinion decide for them. Hmm. You know, and get everyone to scream and yell, and then that other person back down because they're bigger. You know, they have a bigger voice. Adidas don't have no voice. So right. again, I, it's going to be nice to see uh, you know what happens in the end. But I, I wish them both luck. Uh, again, I'm in the fashion business, so I respect everybody's what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, he's doing the same thing with with the Gap. He's saying that some of the Gap hoodies are similar to the Yeezy Gap hoodies, and and so forth. Um, I don't know. I mean, Kanye is going to be Kanye, and he's going to. But but you know, do what he does. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, like I said, you know, if 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 Kanye and I sat down and talked fashion, I would I would direct him in different ways um, that would probably help him a hundred percent. Um, and I would also tell him, remind him of the business. It's, there's business about this. You know, it's called the fashion business, not the fashion. And a lot of people get that twisted. Yeah. And shout out to Kanye, because I think what he's done fashion wise is very impressive. And he came, he came a long way. Yeah. I got you got to give him that. Oh, yeah. got to give it to him. He came a long way. He was begging and scraping. Please let me. But I, but I would have told him, listen, stop trying to be. Uh, um, what's the word looking for? Stop trying to be uh, liked by them. Just do you. You have a huge following. Yeah. Huge. Huge following. To the point we have some lines about him in some of my shows, you know, and huge following. Use that following. Find out what those people want and feed them a product. Yeah, I mean, what he's done with Yeezy sneakers at Adidas, I think is phenomenal. I have a lot of Yeezys in my collection. And I think what he's done with that by creating what I feel is almost like a new genre of sneaker in a way. Well, I think it could be bigger than Jordan. Possibly. Especially right now. Especially right now. You know, right now, everyone's still rocking Jordans from 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. No one's really rocking new Jordans. Right, no. You know, whereas no. a new Yeezy is right. still kind of a big right. deal. Right, And uh, I mean, the fact that he pulled that off because, you know, I mean, there was a serious conversation like when he was leaving Nike, when he had the Yeezys at Nike, which everyone loved. It was like, oh, is he going to be able to pull this off at Adidas? Mm -hmm. eh, a yeah. lot of people are like, not really, because people right. really don't rock Adidas right. like they rock Nike. Right. Right. But look what he did. Right. You know, clothing wise, I don't think he's really made a, a foothold yet in clothing like he has with sneakers. You know, I've tried on some of the, the Gap Yeezy stuff. It's not for me. But I don't know, maybe there will be a following it, for that it, type it, of thing. It, and it's funny, Adidas could make an argument and say, you're actually copying off of me. Hmm. How so? Um, in clothing, uh, what was the, the, the collaboration with the uh, Asian, no, the Asian brand, Asian, there was an Asian Adidas slash Adidas, I can't remember the name. I think I know what you're talking about. Um, and they were... I want to, I don't know if I can use the word exotic. Like, they were like, wow. I uh, forget the name. Is it Yoji Yamamoto? Yes, yes, yes. Yo, yes, yes. So, if you really want to say that could be the knockoff of that. Yeah, Y3. Y3. Yeah. There we go. That was the one I was thinking about. Um, yeah, man. Everyone kind of borrows because, from because everyone it's, else. it's interpretation. Yeah. When I go overseas, I go there, I stay there two, three months. I look around, I, I, I absorb it, I look on the internet, I see what people are wearing, and I interpret my, from what I think what's going to be hot eight months from now. That's what I do every day. Yeah. That's my job. I have to know what's going to be hot, which is hard. Yeah. I have to know from color, concept, logos, everything, from, from design to conception. I got to figure that out and be right every time. Mm -hmm. Or if not, I have a whole warehouse full of stuff. So I have to interpret because you can't, how, how, how much, how much can you, be, how many pockets could you put on the shirt? <laughs> how many buttons? 
How many zippers? Uh, like Louis Vuitton has done some ridiculous stuff yeah. when it comes to pockets and zippers. And nobody, <laughs> see, you, you, you have to understand, when you go see these fashion shows mm -hmm. and you see this most elaborate stuff, that's just for, yeah. oh, wow, They're wow, They're not wow. actually selling Nobody's stuff Nobody's wearing stores. that. Yeah. Nobody's wearing it. I'm sorry. Right. You're not buying. And that's how a company like a, like ours. Shirt, yeah. That's how a couple like ours would, would would make 350 million because everyone would be trying to make make what they see on the runway and nobody would buy it mm -hmm. because there still it goes always back to the actual buyer of the store, and the buyer has to buy stuff based off a region, based off uh, a personality, psychographics, demographics. It, it's business. Yeah, and it seems like a uh, fashion is one of the most treacherous, most difficult businesses to really navigate in. You know, because I remember I, I I interviewed the founders of Cross Colors. Mm -hmm. And and they nice guys. Very nice guys. But they told me how they ultimately, you know, went out of business was they kept basically buying more and more clothes before they sold them. You know, at one point You believe your own height. Yeah. And, and their main buyer at one point was Merry Go Round. Yep, Merry Go Round. Right? Yeah. Who yeah. was, I remember it was like in my local mall, it was a Merry Go Round. Cheap, trendy clothing, not the best quality, but, right. you know, people people bought it and they kept focusing more and more on Merry Go Round. The Merry Go Round goes out of business. And then, so now they have all, all this, this clothes. Warehouse full of clothes. And they have and all this debt. Yep. And part of the debt was tied to their actual brand name. So the name itself, Cross Colors, the copyright on it was tied to this debt. So when they couldn't pay back the debt, the company that lent them the money said, we'll take that. We'll Thank take you. that. Yep. Now, they just tried to come back a few, was it last year? Yeah, no, and, I mean, and they, and they come back and They do, did a, a pop-up yeah. in Nordstrom. Okay. But they did a pop-up in Nordstrom with the original looking clothes. Right. So it's great. But again, like I said, even for us. It's all throwback. It's all throwback. So yeah. what are you going to wear? You know, yeah, the '90s part, because right, the '90s or part. '80s part, '80s part. <laughs> at that. Or, or you could buy the same thing online that somebody held on for 20 years. True, it's a little, little old. Thrifting, yeah. still in, it's it's there. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jay, man, you had quite a life, you know, coming it's, from Queens. And it's not over because again, this media thing is big, and yep. it's, I'm here to stay. Yeah, man, but what you've accomplished with a brand that continues to make money to this day. Uh, building it up to hundreds of millions of dollars a year. I, I mean, everyone at some point has a dream of starting some sort of clothing brand, whether you make your own T-shirt or you make your own hat or or whatever else. But to actually go from that to building a real company. And that's what I've always said, like, to be a successful business person, the idea part is almost not as important as your ability to organize. And execute. And execute. And manage. Yeah, that's really what sets apart the big winners to to the sparks that happen every so often. The, the one hit wonders. Right. You know what I'm and, saying. And if, I, and if I add to that, a lot of times too, you know, I sit I sit in conversation with people, and they go, you know, well, I just need money to help. I just need money, and it's like sometimes it's not necessarily about money. Sometimes it's about making strategic relationships with people and others that can help you get to your next level or get you the next step. And if you can't have a business that doesn't scale, what are you really doing? Don't keep don't tell me about your your website with you know you selling three shirts and you better than me. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't tell me about your you know your one show when I have four series and and five uh, reality shows and a, a, a blockbuster movie coming out. Like stop it. Like I work hard. You too, you should too. <laughs> Did you ever get a chance to sell Fubu? Did anyone ever approach you know one of the other? Yeah, the number one right. Number one's right. No, number one's number right. Number right. Right, because what ultimately happened to Sean John? Did, did they get uh, sold? They went bankrupt. Oh. I think they took him out. I think they, they got taken out of bankruptcy just recently. The puppy just took him, bought him, bought him back. Oh, you bought it back. Right. Uh, okay. and, and again, don't quote me because it may not be bankruptcy. It may just be they just closed down. Uh, but I know he did not own the name and he just bought the name back. And I, I salute him and I hope okay. he can get it, get, it, get it going again. Because we're not the same as far as brands if we're not all together. And that's what made us all work. We can't just have one of us. We have to have a multiple of us. When we used to do magic, we had boots. Everyone had gigantic boots. We had a big presence. So we can't just be there by ourselves. 
You know, we can't just be trying to dwindle. You know, we need to cr cross colors. We need everyone to try to figure out how to come back so we can have a big presence and take over. So then people go, you know what? I want this brand instead of wanting that brand. You know, most people are wanting to be a worker. I want more people to think like an entrepreneur, think like a boss. Yep. You're the boss yourself, so you are an entrepreneur. Think like yeah. that. I mean, because, you know, me and Carl and I still talk sometimes. I mean, he focuses on Japan. Yes. They oh, eat. he's kills, killing it. He is, they kill eat, it, he, eat it up out he there. Don't, he don't have a work a day in his life, <laughs> from what I hear. <laughs> right. He just been sitting back making money, and it's, but it's just him. So we got four guys. They got to spit the money up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, he continued to make money, uh, from what I understand. Uh, Echo still makes money overseas. Yes. You yes. know, people have shifted and continued their business. You know, Rockaware, unfortunately, I think went away. Yes, eventually. Uh, Sean John, like you said, went bankrupt and he mm -hmm. bought it back. We'll see whether he has the time to actually focus right. on that with all his right. other ventures. Yeah, I hope so. You know, you never know, but but you guys definitely are a important, you know, brand in the history of fashion. And what you guys have pulled off, like I said, extremely impressive to sell hundreds well, of millions you. of dollars year after year to go international, to, to really make a mark uh, and really being authentic to who it is that you guys are. You yeah. never really steered no, no away and, and try to cheapen your brand and, and try to sell out and do things that no. everyone, you know, the people would be like, why are they doing that? And again, I had a vision day one. When I went to Damon and said, hey, I can do this. And I, every day I kept go back and say, oh, I, I think I did it. I think I did it. I think I did it. <laughs> and if we ever close, it's like, that I failed. And I don't want to fail. Yeah. That's how we're going to end it. Jay Alexander <laughs> Martin, man, appreciate you coming in. Well, thanks, man. Big fan of what and, you And no, big fan of you, man. Thank you. I heard this was going to be hard. This was yeah. easy. <laughs> I've got a reputation out there. A man. reputation? I've got a reputation. It's not always accurate, but yeah. it is what it is. Hey, listen, again, man, you know, I appreciate you bringing me on. I'm happy for it. No Thanks. doubt. Peace. Peace.